Today, the two leading institutes that promote pedophilia are the Kinsey Institute in Bloomington, Indiana, which receives more than $700,000 a year in taxpayer funding. And in San Francisco, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, a private institution founded by Kinsey's homosexual lover and co-author, Wardell B. Pomeroy. Despite its storefront appearance, the Institute is said to be the Harvard University for all human sexuality training. This institute creates the PhDs, the master's degree people, the teachers, the, the, the bachelor's degrees, the safe sex educators, and a whole variety of other t- AIDS prevention people that go into the schoolrooms all over the country and teach children about homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, bestiality, condoms, and all the rest of it, teach sex. In all cases, These are people who are Kinsian trained. On their official website, the Institute states that there need to be sociosexual activities available to those disadvantaged because of age. Some believe this is a veiled reference to children and that the Institute calls them disadvantaged because it's illegal for them to engage in sex. Can this really be the case? we decided to pay a visit to the Institute and question them about this and some other information on their website. Even if it's two minutes, the pain... No, I really can't. Can you answer uh, one question for us, sir? Needless to say, our initial attempts were met with resistance. There's, there's, can we get just one answer? On your website, which you make public, you say that you help those who are disadvantaged because they're aged sexually. Does that add up to endorsing pedophilia? I would like strongly that. recommend that you turn the camera off and leave right, right now. This is, this private, is private property. property. Get out. Despite what appears to have been a denial, the Institute's website declares it is the sexual right of all people to engage in sexual acts or activities of any kind whatsoever, and that people have the right to sexual entertainment, including sexually explicit materials dealing with the full range of sexual behavior. If taken literally, these so-called rights would obviously include pedophilia and child pornography. Beyond all this, the Institute's founding director, Wardell Pomeroy, wrote the book, Boys and Sex, in which he promoted the idea of boys having sex with animals, such as a dog, a horse, or a bull. Pomeroy also stated that incest between adults and younger children can prove to be a satisfying and enriching experience. To this day, Nambla looks to Alfred Kinsey as their inspiration, saying that gay liberationists in general, and boy lovers in particular, should know Kinsey's work and hold it dear. Implicit in Kinsey is the struggle we fight today. Well, there's a huge connection between Alfred Kinsey and Nambla, In fact, uh, NAMBLA has relied upon Kinsey's research for years. Kinsey uh, tried to make pedophilia seem acceptable. Kinsey's argument was that it was society's reaction to pedophiles that caused the real trauma of child molestation. Members of NAMBLA will often refer to this quote from Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, where Kinsey wrote that, When children are constantly warned by parents and teachers against contacts with adults, They are ready to become hysterical as soon as any older person approaches or stops and speaks to them in the street or fondles them. Some of the more experienced students of juvenile problems have come to believe that the emotional reactions of the parents, police officers, and other adults who discover that the child has had such a contact may disturb the child more seriously than the sexual contacts themselves. But the most disturbing evidence comes from Kinsey's so-called scientific tables, wherein he describes the sexual responses of young children. When I was reading Kinsey's book in the first place, and I looked at the tables, table 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, and these were tables with ages of children on the left-hand side, and then orgasm in one 
panel and timed orgasm, time of orgasm in the next one. In Kinsey's tables 31 through 34, he documented the timed orgasms of children as young as two months old, recording their responses down to the tenth of a second. The findings are so extreme that one child, a four-year-old, is said to have had 26 orgasms within a 24-hour period. For Dr. Reisman, the obvious question was, where did Kinsey get such information? And I, I, I looked at those charts and graphs. I can't tell you how long it took me to try to process what I was seeing. I said, These are, this is the torture of children. At the base of Table 31, Kinsey tells us that the data is based on actual observation of 317 males. Then on page 177 of the male volume, Kinsey writes, orgasm is in our records for a female babe of four months. But how would anyone recognize such a response in a young child? Kinsey wrote that among pre-adolescent boys and among younger females, orgasm is not so readily recognized, partly because of the lack of ejaculate. And so I said, what, what did this man, this Kinsey, called an or, call an orgasm? Right. I mean, it's an obvious question, isn't it? I mean, um, first of all, this was not possible. But second of all, what did he call? Well, I saw he documented it on page 160 and 161 in, in Kinsey's book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. He described specifically what he called an orgasm amongst these children. Kinsey defined orgasm for pre-adolescent children with the following description. A gradual and sometimes prolonged build-up to orgasm, which involves still more violent convulsions of the whole body. Heavy breathing, groaning, sobbing, or more violent cries, sometimes with an abundance of tears, especially among younger children. And he said there were six kinds of, six categories. He called them six categories of orgasm. And he had one, category one, two, three, four, five, and six. And included in these categories of what he called an orgasm were uh, screaming, writhing in pain, hysterics, especially among younger children. He put that in parenthesis, especially among younger children, parenthesis. Um, he said that the children had convulsions. Those were his words. He said they fainted. He said they, they struck the partner. He called it the partner. This is the man who's raping the child. Okay. They struck the partner and tried to get away. And, and he said that those were all examples for him, for him, of orgasm. Kinsey made it clear that this data was supplied by adult observers who were defined as pedophiles by Kinsey's own team members, as you will hear later on. Kinsey wrote, Some males suffer excruciating pain and may scream. The males in the present group, by which he meant pre-adolescent boys, become similarly hypersensitive before the arrival of actual orgasm, will fight away from the partner, and may make violent attempts to avoid climax, although, he said, they derive definite pleasure from the situation. Kinsey's willingness to work with the devil at one point seemed to take on a very literal meaning. One of the interesting things I found several years ago in researching the Satanist Aleister Crowley uh, was the influence that he has had on so many people here in the United States of America. And one of the man, men that he had influenced was Alfred Kinsey. After publishing his male and female reports, Kinsey began to travel abroad and study sexuality in foreign countries. In his book, Kinsey co-author Wardell Pomeroy wrote that Kinsey went looking for a prized item, the diaries of Aleister Crowley. Crowley died just a year before uh, Kinsey's book came out. Crowley was a famous and highly controversial British occultist in the early part of the 20th century. His sexual exploits in bizarre and sometimes deadly satanic rituals had been exposed in the London newspapers. He also talked about taking a virgin and having sexual relations with her and then upon a climax 
to actually murder her, cut her in six pieces, and put the names of the various demon gods on those six limbs, those six parts of her body. Taking the name for the Antichrist in the Bible, Crowley called himself the Beast 666. His famous saying was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, by which he justified all forms of immorality. Crowley had a sex temple and had practiced uh, group sex and orgies and what have you, and so-called sex magic. Crowley was into pedophilia. He was into uh, justifying his pedophilia. In fact, he had said, let me seduce the boys of England. He wanted to seduce them, and he, then he starts talking about sodomy and it being, should be acceptable. So, uh, I mean, it was quite shocking, especially back then. Pomeroy wrote that Crowley was called by Lord Douglas the wickedest man who ever lived, and his sexual history alone was enough to earn him the title he gloried in, the Beast. Crowley kept a diary up to his death. Two weeks after Kinsey tracked down these papers in England, he found himself in the temple that the Beast had founded in Sicily. Kinsey is pictured here inside Crowley's temple, known as the Abbey Philema, where he performed his satanic rituals. On the wall is a picture of Crowley himself, while across from Kinsey is another man named Kenneth Anger. Anger was a close acquaintance who appeared in some of Kinsey's sex films, made in the attic of his Bloomington home. As an avant-garde filmmaker, Anger was deeply involved in the occult. He directed films with titles such as Lucifer Rising and The Invocation of My Demon Brother. Kenneth Anger uh, is a co-founder of uh, Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, and Kenneth Anger uh, also was, you know, had a penchant for younger men, for sure. Bobby Beausoleil was his living boyfriend. That's the same Bobby Beausoleil that committed the first murder, uh, killing him and for uh, Charles Manson. That was his living boyfriend. He played Lucifer in one of his uh, occult uh, movies that extolled the virtues of Aleister Crowley's magic and what have you. In this image from one of Anger's films, we see Bobby Beausoleil, who would later become one of Charles Manson's killers. He's standing next to a doorway with Crowley's maxim, do what thou wilt, painted on the door. A phrase that certainly fit with Kinsey's own view of human sexuality. Pomeroy even admits that, that Kinsey uh, loved uh, Crowley's writings, including uh, specifically mentioning some of his homosexual erotica. Uh, one of his books called White Stains. Kenneth Anger is quoted saying that Kinsey was obsessed with obtaining the Great Beast's day-to-day -day sex diaries. To obtain grant monies and maintain the support of the university, Kinsey needed the excuse of research to validate his 24 hours a day obsession with sex. However, Kinsey's battle cry of do your best and let other people react as they will seemed a variation on Crowley's do what thou wilt maxim. An older Kenneth Anger is pictured here with the name Lucifer tattooed on his chest. So important was Anger's relationship with Kinsey that to this day, the Kinsey Institute Library features a Kenneth Anger collection with an archive of Anger's films as well as the correspondence between him and Alfred Kinsey. Should America be disturbed that the father of her sexual revolution who changed American law and laid the foundation for sex education had such associations? If America continues to be influenced by Kinsey, what will it mean for her future? What Kinsey discovered at Crowley's mysterious abbey might provide a clue. Pomeroy writes that Crowley's curious magnetism drew people from all over the world who came and became his sexual slaves. Some of these women left their husbands to enter the temple. They held group orgies as part of their ritual and included in them the small children the women had brought. He further reveals that inside the abbey, Kinsey found paintings, life-sized representations of sexual activity, including children. 
Some have considered the possibility that a Lester Crowley was another of Kinsey's pedophiles who kept his diaries as part of Kinsey's sex research. I would be surprised if Kinsey uh, was not, in fact, either paying or communicating with Crowley regarding his sex diaries because Crowley was more open and more public with his sexual exploits than pretty much anybody of the time. He was known as the wickedest man on the earth long before uh, Kinsey would have gone to him. He was far more uh, accessible than, say, a Nazi officer in Germany uh, to Kinsey, and, and as, as ugly as Crowley was to so many people, uh, he wasn't nearly as known or, or there wasn't the reputation that there was with the Nazis. And at the same time, Crowley uh, could have used the money in the 1940s. He had, uh, you know, he wasn't as rich as he was. He had spent a lot of his money, so he would have been more open to that. And then to see that Kinsey was actually reading Crowley's stuff, we know that from Pomeroy. And it would be hard to believe that he wasn't already working with Crowley and encouraging Crowley to continue on with his sexual exploits. One way or another, the, the net effect is the same. Kinsey was fostering much of the same revolution that Crowley had begun over in England and was helping continue what Crowley hoped would take place in the United States of America. During the 1930s and 1940s, the OTO Lodge in California was headed by a brilliant young rocket designer called Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons developed patented rocket technology, which is still in use by NASA to this day. NASA named a crater on the dark side of the moon in honor of Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons worked during the day to develop rocket propulsion systems which would serve NASA's space program, which was controlled by ex-Nazi SS officers such as Werner von Braun, who had been brought to the USA by the CIA's Project Paperclip. At night, Jack Parsons would hold sex magic rituals in his house in Pasadena and initiate fellow scientists at the Los Alamos Atomic Bomb Laboratory. Jack Parsons was fully aware of what his rocket designs would eventually be used for. Not far from Jack Parsons' rocket lab in Pasadena, Robert Oppenheimer was building the world's first atom bomb, which would be exploded at Los Alamos, near a place called the Road of Death, which lies on the 33rd degree parallel. Once installed as the head of the OTO's American operation, Jack Parsons conducted a giant satanic ritual, aided by a fellow OTO member with the code name Freighter H. In 1948, the same year that George Bush Sr. was baptized as Magog, Jack Parsons undertook one of the most dark rituals known to Kabbalists. The Babylon working. This ritual requires the initiate to visualize the Kabbalistic tree of life with its 10 spheres and 22 connecting pathways. Between the top three spheres and the lower seven spheres, there is the so-called abyss, the place where one's personality, possibly even one's sanity, 
is potentially destroyed. If the initiate successfully spans the abyss with personality intact, then he becomes a black brother of the Kabbalah, a black magician of the so-called left-hand path. In the tradition of Judaic mysticism, these black magicians are utter evil and are in themselves pestilence. This giant Babylon working ritual saw Parsons, aided by his magical protege, Freighter H, project their astral bodies into the dark abyss of Lucifer. 1948 saw George Bush Sr. baptized in the name of Magog, the spirit who would lead the army of demons against Christ at the apocalypse of Armageddon. That same year, Jack Parsons baptized himself as Balerion Armilas al-Dajjal, the Antichrist. Parsons took on the ancient Judaic teaching that Christ and his church were the enemy of civilization and that they had to be destroyed. On a 40-day pilgrimage in the Mojave Desert, the place where Area 51 now resides, Parsons summoned forth Babylon, the Scarlet Woman, the Whore of the Apocalypse, the consort of the great beast, Satan 666. According to the mysterious Freighter H, during the ritual he saw Parsons rip a hole in space-time and something evil flew in. So who was the mysterious Freighter H? None other than the author and inventor of the new cult religion of Scientology, Mr. L. Ron Hubbard. Former initiate of Aleister Crowley's OTO, Hubbard wrote a so-called sacred text called Dianetics, which now has an inspired following of evangelical millionaires in Hollywood, just as the Kabbalah training schools are now brim full of people who had their interest in these Judaic magical techniques inspired by Britney Spears and Madonna. Jack Parsons had a sex magic partner in the OTO named Marjorie Cameron. Whilst staying with her friend Renata Drooks in Hollywood, Marjorie Cameron confessed that she had been part of the Babylon working ritual. She said that it had been devised by Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard, Alistair Crowley and Manhattan Project scientists based at the Los Alamos Atomic Bomb Research Unit headed by Jewish scientist Robert Oppenheimer. Marjorie Cameron confessed that during the Babylon working ritual assisted by L. Ron Hubbard, Jack Parsons had sexually impregnated her at the point when the spirit of the Antichrist was bestowed upon him. Cameron Parsons had been made pregnant with the child of the Antichrist.
Crowley had hoped to get his disciples into influential positions in America to influence the masses. One such disciple was former Harvard professor turned drug guru, Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary, the defunct Harvard professor, led the drug revolution in the 1960s as he handed out mescaline and LSD like it was candy to the youth. This in turn opened up the hippie youth of the West to the pagan demonic gods of the East who were also promoted by a Lester Crowley. We can see here that Timothy Leary is under a painting which bears the number of the Antichrist, 666, who is prophesied to rule the world until he's destroyed by Christ at Armageddon. Timothy Leary claimed that he came to the realization that he was to usher in Crowley's new age when he was using Crowley's tarot cards. Leary asked the question, who am I and what is my destiny? Leary claims that he then cut to the ace of disc. Robert Anton Wilson declared, this shows a large disc bearing the Greek letters to Megatherion, the great beast. Leary interpreted this to mean that he is Crowley reborn and is supposed to complete the work Crowley began. On a PBS interview, Timothy Leary let his hair down and admitted that he was carrying on Satanist Aleister Crowley's work and that the 1960s is when the plan began to come to fruition. Well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said uh, uh, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, finding your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. As Satan guided Crowley, Crowley declared that his writings were to be, quote, circulated among the young, end quote. Crowley predicted that America would pick up, quote, a few axioms on which a working majority can agree, a few dogmas which it could rally. Do what thou wilt, of course, became do your own thing, and if it feels good, do it in the 1960s. Timothy Leary came up with a few of his own. He looked out at that crowd and he said, Turn on, tune in, That's right. and drop out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. We're turned on, and we're tuned in, and we're very dropped out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. 